Next lab is the Nervous System Lab, and this is the first of three big labs this semester. So we have the Nervous System, the Skeletal, and the Muscular. The rest are all kind of small. So this is going to be a little bit different than the ones you've done up until now. So our first diagram that we need to fill out is a generic neuron. So we have different parts of the neuron cell and we need to label what they are. We are going to start here, so this label here, which is the cell body which contains the missal bodies. Coming off of the cell body, we have all of these small appendages. These are the dendrites, which are going to receive signals. So they're going to receive signals from a different neuron. At the bottom of our cell body here, where it starts to narrow a little bit, this is the axon hillock. And as we continue down the axon hillock, we get this one very skinny appendage, and this is the axon itself. Wrapped around the axon is the myelin sheath, which is the essentially insulation that's going to help keep the electrical impulses inside. And then those impulses, it shows it running down this way to the very, very end, which is the axon terminal. You notice there are little gaps between the myelin sheath. These are called the nodes of Ranvier. Next, we have a slide that you've seen before. This is just a, a neuron. And so now we have to label some parts of it, though. And so the cell, the dark purple itself, is the neuron. The center large portion is the neuron cell body. The nucleus is here in the center. It's not as obvious on this one as it is on some other cells. The dendrites are going to be smaller appendages. Now, smaller and larger is a, is a subjective term. And so when you're looking at, at a... Uh, let's say a, neur a neuron, it can be difficult to tell in the microscope what's a an dendrite and what is an axon. So I'll just pick out some of the smaller ones here. Those are certainly going to be dendrites. All of these little purple dots look like confetti. Those are the nuclei of the neuroglial cells. So those are the helper cells. They're much smaller but much more numerous than the neurons. Answer your questions. Oops, sorry, I scrolled past. Let's go back up. This is a nerve synapse. So this is where the axon terminal of one neuron meshes with the dendrite of the next neuron in the sequence. So this is a synapse. A synapse is transfer of information from one to another. So this here is the axon terminal. Where it gets wider here at the very, very end is called the synaptic knob. Located in the synaptic knob are, the, are these bubbles. Hopefully you know what these bubbles are. They're vesicles, but they're technically, in this case, called synaptic vesicles. So those vesicles are going to contain a neurotransmitter. When those vesicles merge with the plasma membrane of the axon here, it's going to release the neurotransmitter, which is this label here, into the synaptic cleft, which is this label here. Synaptic cleft is the actual empty space between the axon and the dendrite. They don't actually touch each other. And so, the synaptic vesicle releases the neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft. It diffuses across the synaptic cleft and is received by the receptor on the dendrite. So there's your questions that you can answer. Now we move to the brain. So the brain is certainly the most complicated part of the body that we've learned about in the lab so far. We have a lot of things to label here. So this is looking at the skull, the scalp, the brain, and all the different layers that are there. And so there's more layers than you think there are. So obviously the scalp is on the outside, 
Under that, we have the skull bone with the periosteum. But then under that, we have a number of layers. Okay, and those layers are called the meninges. We have three of them. The outermost layer is the dura mater. So the dura mater is this layer here. And then under that, so this one here, if you can see it, it's purple. This is the arachnoid mater. Then more difficult to see. It's a very light pink. It's, it's very tight on the brain, almost like shrink wrap. This is the pia mater. So think that. Dura, arachnoid, pia. Starting from the outside and going in. D-A-P. So this little empty spot here they're asking us to label is pointing to the empty space between this, which is the dura mater, and this, which is the arachnoid mater. And so it is under the dura mater. So we call it the subdural space. This one is under the arachnoid mater. And so it is the subarachnoid space. This here is pointing to this larger cave here. This is the superior sagittal sinus. And so you notice that the top part of the dura mater stays right under the skull, whereas the lower part of the dura mater, the arachnoid and the pia, fold in here. What you're looking at is the, the space between the two hemispheres of the brain. And we'll see that and a, a slide or two, but this is one hemisphere, this is another, and then these meninges actually fold between them. And when they fold in, we're left with this empty space here, which is the superior sagittal sinus. This is a diagram of the dura mater itself, and to me, this is maybe the most confusing diagram in the entire semester. If you're able to make it to open lab and look at the model of this, it may help you. Okay, but even to me, even that, that even that model is sort of confusing. Remember that what you're looking at is only the dura mater. All of this blue is dura mater, just one layer of the meninges. Okay, and so this large part, this this, this largest part here is the fold of the dura mater that goes between the hemispheres. What you're looking at is we've cut, cut the skull in half, removed the brain, and so you're looking at the fold of the dura mater that's between the two hemispheres of the brain. This fold is called the falx cerebri. Up here, at the very, very top, the darker areas are more empty space. So that this one up top, running along the top, is the superior sagittal sinus. This one running along the bottom, up here, is the inferior sagittal sinus. This little fold here is the tentorium cerebelli. So this is the fold of the dura mater that separates the cerebrum up here from the cerebellum, which would be down here. And then this fold that comes down back behind the cerebellum is the falx cerebelli. Answer your questions, and we move on to the cerebrum itself. Now, most of our diagrams are going to be color coded. Real brains aren't color coded. Okay. So if you go online and you find a picture of a brain, or if you make it to Open Lab, they, they have an actual human brain that they that we look at in in class. I don't know whether they show it to you in Open Lab, but you can at least try and ask them. It's not going to look nearly as neat as this. Okay, it's not going to be easy to tell one part from another. A diagram that I show you on a lab exam, if I'm asking you a specific part of the brain. It's most likely going to be colored. Okay. So here we're looking at at cerebellum from the top. So this is an anterior view, and you see we have the left and the right hemispheres. 
and then we have that fold in between them. That fold is called the longitudinal fissure. So a fissure is a very, very large fold. A sulcus is a small fold. And so all these little wrinkles that you're seeing where they fold in are sulci. Each one is a sulcus. A large fold is a fissure. So this sulcus here is more or less in the center. We call that the central sulcus. With the folds, not only do you have where it folds down, but you have the part that folds up. Those where it folds up is a gyrus. The plural is gyri. And so this is the pre-central gyrus and the post-central gyrus. And so pre is it before or in front of the central sulcus. So the pre-central gyrus and then the central sulcus and then the post-central gyrus. Over here we have the central sulcus again. So we have the pre-central and post-central gyrus. Here we see a different sulcus that we couldn't see from the top. This is the lateral sulcus. Back here we have the parieto-occipital sulcus, and then between the cerebrum and the cerebellum, we have the transverse fissure. So this is the cerebrum, this is the cerebellum. Next, we talk about the ventricles. Ventricles are open spaces in the brain where cerebrospinal fluid is made and circulates. When you look at this, you need to imagine where, wherever it's blue, that is open space. Okay, and this, these are buried inside of the brain. These large parts here, up top here, are lateral ventricles. There are two of them. There's one here, one here. There is one in each hemisphere of the brain. So they are not directly in the center. There's one off to the left one off to the right. Here, in between them, is the third ventricle. And so we said there's one, two, we didn't name one the first and one the second, there's just two laterals. But then after that, there's a third one, which is the third ventricle. And then down here, at the, the base of the spinal cord, we have the fourth ventricle. The fourth ventricle is connected to the third by the cerebral aqueduct. And so the cerebral spinal fluid is being made in these ventricles and then it's flowing through them and then essentially flowing down from one ventricle to the next. Our next diagram is labeling the lobes of the brain and also the functional areas. So what is happening in each area? We're going to start with the lobes. Easy one is the frontal lobe. This is the front of the brain. The front of the brain is the frontal lobe. Now there's sort of easy one on the side is the temporal lobe. It's essentially where you think of the temples on your head as being. The top side Toward, and heading towards the back is the parietal lobe. And then in the very, very back is the occipital lobe. Some of these we'll come back to again when we talk about the skull, because we have the frontal bone, the parietal bone, occipital bone, and temporal bone. They're in the same location. So if you remember them now, you'll remember them when you get to the skeleton. Next is the functional areas. And so we have the central sulcus here, so the pre-central gyrus, the blue here is the motor area, post-central is somatosensory. Back in the occipital lobe, in the very, very back of the brain, it's labeled yellow here, is the visual area. The auditory area is on the side, which makes sense because that's where your ears 
R. And then we have these two odd spots here, the yellow there and pink here. The yellow is the Wernicke area. Wernicke area is the part of our brain that's responsible for understanding and creating language. So when you're hearing me talk, that's being processed by your Wernicke area. If you then are going to turn to someone sitting next to you and tell them something, deciding what you're going to say is also going to be the Wernicke area. The pink up here is the Broca area, which is responsible for speech, actually speaking it, whether it be out loud or putting it into words. It's not deciding what you're going to say. It's the actual part of your brain that's responsible for doing it. Okay. Some people like to remember this because broca sounds like boca, which in Spanish means mouth. Next, we're going to move a little deeper into our brain and look at the diencephalon. So the diencephalon is in the cerebrum, but in, it's in this very center. Okay. And when you look at this, there are some landmarks that you're going you're gonna to need to find a way that you can pick out where on the brain you're looking, find the diencephalon, and then locate things in the diencephalon. When I'm trying to find the diencephalon as a whole, I look for this big arch up here. That's called the corpus callosum. Everything below that arch is the diencephalon. Then, as a landmark inside of that, I look for this large structure with a bump on it. That is the thalamus. On a diagram, on a model, it's either going to be a dot, there's going to be a bump. Okay, we'll look for that. That is your landmark. That is on the thalamus. Kind of down below, a little bit in front of the thalamus, is the hypothalamus. Hypo means low. So this is the thalamus. This is the low or hypothalamus. Behind the thalamus is the pineal gland. Down below in front of the thalamus is the pituitary gland. You're going to be tempted to switch them. Remember the pineal gland is behind the thalamus. Pineal gland makes melatonin, which makes you sleepy. The pituitary gland we'll learn about in the endocrine lecture it makes a lot of things that remain that maintain growth and metabolism. But this is larger. The pituitary gland is larger than the pineal gland. Continuing on down, we have the brain stem, which is the, the kind of the juncture between the brain itself and the spinal cord, and then we have the cerebellum. So we're going to start with the cerebellum, because that's the, the more obvious structure here. This is cerebellum. Cerebellum is made up of two hemispheres, just like the cerebrum is. What you're looking at is just half. As so we've removed one hemisphere, you're looking at the inside of the other half. The white vein-like structures here are the arbor vitae. This, the rest of it, is the gray matter. This structure between the cerebellum and the brainstem is actually that fourth ventricle. The same fourth ventricle that we saw earlier, we're just seeing it from a little different angle here. And then over here we have the three main parts of the brainstem. The uppermost piece is the midbrain. The largest piece, the piece that kind of juts out a little bit, is the pons. And then the lower part is the medulla oblongata. Then we get to the spinal cord itself. And so we have regions based on where they are in the body. I'm going to zoom out a little bit here. So in the cervical region, we have cervical spinal nerves, 
And so we have the spinal cord running down the center, and then we have spinal nerves that come off of it. So in the cervical region, we have the spinal nerves coming off, called the cervical spinal nerves. In the thoracic region, we have the thoracic spinal nerves and the lumbar spinal nerves. And then down at the bottom here, we have the sacral spinal nerves. Now if you look at the spinal cord itself, which is the yellow portion here, you'll notice it kind of changes in size. In the cervical region, it's fairly wide. We call that the cervical enlargement. And then in the thoracic region, it's a little skinnier. We get down to the lumbar region, and it gets wide again. So we call that the lumbar enlargement. At the very, very bottom of the spinal cord, we'll say this is actually the end of the spinal cord right here. It's the conus medullaris. It's a little cone shape here. Now, it looks like the spinal cord continues on down. What we have coming down are little projections, little fingers that come off of the spinal cord itself. And this little meshwork is called the cauda equina because it kind of looks like the tail of a horse, which is the cauda equina. Running down the center of the cauda equina is a larger projection called the phylum terminal, and that runs all the way down to the tailbone for the coccyx. Then we can take our spinal cord and take a cross section of it and look at the spinal cord function in parts itself. Now there are three main things you need to look at here. There are the spinal nerves coming off the side, you have the lighter colored portion, and then you have the darker colored butterfly portion. We're going to start in the center with the butterfly portion. It is darker. This is gray matter. So gray matter is going to have no myelin. So different parts of this, we have these little projections. We call them horns. When you look at the spinal cord, you're going to need to figure out what is the anterior side, what is the posterior side. The way I do it is I look for these little grooves. There's a groove in the front, a groove in the back. The one in the front is larger. In the front, we have the anterior median fissure. In the back is the posterior median sulcus. So remember, a fissure is larger than a sulcus. The anterior median fissure is in front. The posterior median sulcus is in the back. So this is the front, the anterior portion here. And so this is the anterior horn. There's one, two anterior horns, and two posterior horns, which would be labeled here. Coming off to the side, here and here, this blank, is the lateral horn. In the very, very center is the central canal. Moving out to the lighter colored portion, the lighter colored portion is the white matter, but I don't believe it's labeled here. But on the side of the white matter here is the lateral column. And so gray matter has horns, white matter has columns, and this is on the lateral side. And so this is the lateral column. There's one here, another one over here. In the back, we have the posterior column. In the front, we have an anterior column. Two anterior columns, two posterior columns, two lateral columns. Just looking to see if I missed anything. Then we can move to the spinal nerves. So the spinal nerves connect to the spinal cord, one coming off each side. They always come in pairs. And so it, part of it connects in the back, part of it connects in the front. Back is dorsal. The posture and dorsal are the same thing, and so we call this the dorsal root of the spinal nerve. Anterior is the same as ventral, and so this is the ventral root of the spinal nerve. 
This is pointing to the spinal nerve itself. This kind of enlargement on the spinal nerve is called the dorsal root ganglion. It's the dorsal root ganglion because it's on the dorsal root. Now remember, you need to know in the back and the front of the spinal cord which direction are things going. Or in the spinal nerve, is the signals coming through here headed up or are they headed down? Remember, based on lecture, back up. In the back of the spinal cord, signals are going to go up. If they are going up, they are headed towards the brain. Those are sensory nerves, sensory signals. If it's going up in the back, that means it's coming down in the front. It's coming from the brain to the effectors, whether they be muscles or organs. So those are motor sensors and motor nerves. Here we look at a little bit zoomed out picture of the spinal cord in relation to the vertebrae that it runs through. So this one is already labeled for you, but what you're looking at is the spinal cord here, the vertebrae here, and then we have the same meninges that we have around the brain around our spinal cord. So we have the dura mater, arachnoid mater, and pia mater. But here we also have the epidural space. The subdural space under the dura mater. The epidural space is above the dura mater between it and the bone. So if you know someone or yourself who's got an epidural that is being shot into this epidural space here. Questions for you to answer. Then we get to a diagram of a nerve. This is a peripheral nerve. Up until now we've talked about the central nervous system. This is the peripheral nervous system. So this is, let's actually zoom in a little bit. This is sort of bundles, bundled together to make larger bundles, bundled together to make even larger bundles. So we are going to start at the smallest level here. This blue is an axon. This is a myelinated axon. It has myelin around it. And then wrapped around it, putting that myelin on it, is the Schwann cell. Then, wrapped around that is the endoneurium. So this is the endoneurium. This is pointing to a membrane around this. And it's not pointing to the outer layer here. It's pointing to the layer right around here, which is one of these structures. So this is pointing to the outer layer of this bundle. This is pointing to the perineurium. Here, this is pointing to this membrane wrapping around here. This is pointing to the bundle, sorry. This is pointing to the membrane, which is the perineurium. This is pointing to the bundle, which is a fascicle, which they didn't put up in your word bank here. So we have endoneurium and then perineurium. Then we can take a bundle of fascicles. So we have a bundle of axons is a fascicle. A bundle of fascicles is a nerve. And that nerve has a membrane around it called the epineurium. Epi is outer, peri is middle, endo is inside. Running along with our fascicles in our nerve, we have blood vessels, red and blue blood vessels labeled here. Then there is a slide of a peripheral nerve. It doesn't look anything at all like that. Okay, so we're not going to label all that much here. We need to find fascicles, we need to find the perineurium, and we need to find blood vessels. Now, 
first thing you need to realize is a nerve is fairly large. So when what we're zoomed in here, we're looking at part of a nerve. And so this here is actually a fascicle, not the nerve itself. The nerve is much larger. We're looking at just a piece of it. So this is a fascicle. The membrane around a fascicle is the perineurium. And so this darker pink running around the fascicle is the perineurium. And then these open areas, there's the best example here, would be the blood vessel. Some more questions for you. And then the final thing are the cranial nerves. And we have 11 of them. No, there's only 9 of them here, though. And so what you need to do is you need to tell me, are these 9 cranial nerves sensory, motor, or both? You can look them up wherever you need to look them up. Only, I'll tell you now, I would say only one of them is both. If you look them up, you're going to see, well, it's one of them may be 99% sensory and 1% motor. Only one of them legitimately plays a large role in both sensory and motor, and that is the trigeminal. All the other ones, I would suggest labeling them as sensory or motor rather than both. And then you need to tell me the function of them. So I know there's a lot of information here, but unfortunately there is nothing here that we can skip. You need to know all of it. You need to, if you see a picture of a diagram, you need to be able to tell me what it is. You need to tell me what it's doing and how it fits in with the rest. If you have any questions, send me a message. There's a lot of stuff here. I can certainly help you understand what you're talk, what you're, what you're missing but I need to know what help you need. So I hope to hear from you. When you're finished, submit it, you can move on.